Nonsense, you little devil. Do you want to die? Thank God nothing happened on my way to a place where an accident happened many years ago. A fire accident, and the establishment came to a halt. It was the Ravi Varma Lithographic Press. Here it stands, name board even removed. Ravi Varma Lithographic Press in Lonavala, a hill station which is shifted from Mumbai, where it started functioning in 1886. It is from this press that gods and goddesses with human faces started their journey into the prayer rooms of common people of India. The press started by Raja Ravi Varma wasn't the first in India, however. Earlier printing was done in Kolkata, but it was mostly for the use of printing books and the technical and artistic mastery showed by Ravi Varma was unmatched. This press could provide prints throughout the nation with about 40,000 lithographic stones. Ravi Varma started this press with the capital of 80,000 rupees, the remuneration he got from his Baroda commission of mythological paintings. When this amount was inadequate, he made a Mumbai-based businessman as his partner. Since Ravi Varma lacked a good business acumen, the press at last went into the hands of Sleischer, the German technician at the Ravi Varma Press. Prayer rooms of many homes in India contain at least one print of Ravi Varma's gods and goddesses. Thousands of these lithostones, which were the main asset of the press, are now destroyed or taken away to some unknown destination. History hijacked.
The vibrations of artistic heritage one feels when entering into the premises of Kilimanjaro Palace is amazing. Ravi Varma belonged to this palace of aristocratic Hindu Chhatriya family, an elite warrior class. But warfare and military prowess in his family had long been a thing of the past. Fine arts and music were the accomplishments that several members of his family sought after. Sanskrit scholars, poets and musicians were to be found amongst his close relations. His mother, besides practicing Ayurvedic medicine, also composed music for the traditional Dulal opera performances, which were held in the dance halls of feudal courts. Parvati Swayambaram is a poetic work meant for Tulal performance which was written by Ravi Varma's mother, Uma Ambabai Tamburati, and published posthumously by Ravi Varma. <laughs> The members of the family usually engage themselves in recitals of epics like the Bhagavata and the Ramayana during their leisure time. Katakali and Kudiyatam troops were maintained in the palace and the strains of its music and drumbeats complemented the classical ragas as they regularly echoed within the premises. The impact of this cultural background is evident in his paintings like The Birth of Shakuntala and Krishna at Envoy. Rhetorical postures, the hyperbolic gestures, notably the enlarged pupils of the eyes, are none other than the mimics conventions of Kathakali, the dance drama of Kerala. Mumbai was almost a second home to Ravi Varma. During his sojourn in Mumbai, his interest in theatre and other performing arts like music and dance got wide exposure. And these art forms had great influence on him, especially the Parsi theatre. A lot of sketches were drawn by him in this time. He used to paint these figures in a later period, no matter where he was stationed. It is during one of his short stays in Mumbai he happened to see the drama Shakuntal by Anna Sahib Kiloska, a Parsi theatre production. This obviously had an influence on Ravi Varma's later canvases on Shakuntala. Mumbai life of Ravi Varma is sketched in his brother Raja Raja Varma's diary, and it has a lot to speak. It reveals Varma's use of models and the difficulty involved in it. Many sketches were found for the painting At the Bath, which Ravi Varma did in 1902. This painting, a masterpiece now housed in Kaudia Palace, Thiravanandapuram, is modelled on a Mohammedan prostitute. Anjana Malpeka was a dancer and a musician from Mumbai who posed as a model for several of Ravi Varma's paintings. For the paintings of Mohini, Lakshmi, Saraswati and Ganga, and Jana was evidently the model. The artist's daughter Mahaprabha Thamburati and her son Martanda Varma became models for the painting Here Comes Papa. The identity of the model for the painting Malabar Beauty is unknown, but the existence of a model for this painting is revealed through this photograph. And she is Rajibai, Varma's model featured in Lady with a Fan, executed by Frank Brooks, who was commissioned by Ravi Varma to teach Raja Raja Varma. Dewan T. Madhava Rao, who was instrumental in many ways in making Ravi Varma a cult figure. Baroda City. The importance of this city in Ravi Varma's life is immense. Through the efforts of Madhava Rao, then regent of Baroda, Ravi Varma's painting Siddha Bhumi Pravesh finally reached the Baroda Palace. When it reached there, it created a sensation due to the dual merit, the theme, and the exemplary execution of the work. Ravi Varma and Raja Raja Varma were honored guests during the investiture of His Highness Sayoji Rao of Baroda 
in 1881. During his subsequent stay in Baroda, he did many portraits, including the royal families. Along with these portraits, Ravi Varma did four religious paintings also, the Fantastic Four. Two among these four portrayed paintings of goddesses Lakshmi and Saraswati got mass appeal. Later, oleographs of these paintings flooded India. The Maharaja of Baroda, who was in high praise for Ravi Varma, made even a studio for the artist in Baroda, that also in the palace grounds itself. The studio was a highly accomplished one. He made windows and doors so large and glass to get sunlight aplenty that the artist can work in any corner of the studio. Nowhere else did Ravi Varma get this much affection and regard. Some years later, the Maharaja, who was on a vacation in Uti, called for Ravi Varma again and commissioned him for 14 mythological paintings for the Lakshmi Villas Palace, which was under construction. Prior to embarking on his commission, accompanied by Raja Raja Varma, he travelled all over India in search of ancient culture and traditions of different regions of India. All these 14 paintings were structured from the word pictures of Valmiki, Vyasa and Kalidasa. Barodila Maharaja Vaya Sayajira Vindu Nirdesha Pragaram Purana Chitrangal Varikyan Tudangiya the Devigar Meda Kalaji Vithatili Vindu Vajithiri Vaya Irindu Padinale Chitrangal Anallo Raja Devigar Ma Barodila Maharaja Vindu Aavishya Pragaram Anna Varachadu what M. G. Shashi Bhushan, historian and research scholar, says is that when orders for paintings poured in, he was not able to cope with the demands. It is this that compelled him to establish a lithographic press. The oleographs of gods came out from this press got mass appeal due to their realistic portrayal. Even though, before Ravi Varma also, paintings of gods and goddesses were there. They were all exaggerated or primitive in style. To overcome this only, Ravi Varma chose a realistic portrayal of the gods and goddesses, and he succeeded in his attempt. The first pictures to come out of the Ravi Varma press were The Birth of Shakuntala, Saraswati and Lakshmi. Then came the variety of mythological characters and national figures. Thus he achieved national integration. A national integration through his artistic perspective. These are some of the oleographs from Kadkopa and Lonavala presses of Rave Varma. Raja Raja Varma's diary is the most reliable document about the artist's life and career. A trained painter, Raja Raja Varma's landscape paintings are superior to any other Indian artist's work in that genre. As R.P. Raja, research scholar, says, The second of Raja Varma was uh, very painful for him because uh, his brother Raja Raja Varma, who was a very close associate of him, both uh, physically as well as uh, emotionally and in his artistic work, passed away in 1904. Uh, more than that, it was added, another agony was added because earlier, a few months ago, his brother Gaudarma also died. So the demise of two brothers uh, in very close uh, time frame had uh, put the Raja Ravarma in a very great uh, mental agony and uh, emotional upset. Not only that, the demise of Raja Ravarma has affected his uh, works also because he could not complete many of the orders which had been given to him. 
So added on to these uh, demises was also the fact that the press which he was running went into a great loss and that also caused a lot of uh, trouble and agony for him. So one can say that uh, he was also physically having a problem, a little bit of problem through his diabetes. So the fact that uh, Raja Rivarma had been a little painful for him in many ways. For Jadayu Vadham, also models exist. Varma did the sketches for this painting at the premises of Kilimanur Palace. He put a sword in the hands of a relative named Goda Varma and set him to hold a teenage niece of Ravi Varma, like in the posture seen in the painting. See the brilliance of the work. What a powerful stroke! the demand of the Maharaja of Mysore, Ravi Varma did Jadayu Vadham for a second time in 1906. The vacuum created by the absence of Raja Raja Varma and his physical fatigue were all visible in this remake. Shakuntala looking back and Lady in the Moonlight are good studies in Ravi Varma's command over lighting. In Shakuntala, the invisible source of light is the sun. The sun's position is suggested masterly through the shadows, and in the other, the canvas is totally moonlit. Likewise, he made the ornaments shine on his characters lifelike. The details are given in such a way as the beholder would like to have it in his hands and enjoy the beauty of it. Krishna and Yashoda, and portrait of Maharani Lakshmibai, who is his sister-in-law, are fine examples. Maybe his Tanjore influence. In the case of costume, though he painted women of many communities and classes, Ravi Varma had a special fondness for depicting the sari-clad women of Bombay, where he lived for many years. He found the sari, they're not worn in Kerala, with its striking colours and graceful folds especially appealing. His female figures in their traditional dresses are also featured with each and every minute detail of the fabric. Actually, he chose women as his main theme, for it is they who carry with them the country's traditions in costume and jewellery and convey the tenor of Indian life. His technical genius manifests in his bigger canvases, with the number of characters and their most effective placement. One among these, Draupadi and the court of Virata, is an example to this point, and boasts no less than twenty figures. But they are accommodated without any compromise on light and space between each of them. Every detail and emotion on each face is depicted with utmost care. Rugmangada and Mohini and the court of Indrajit and galaxy of musicians are some other examples. Another brilliance, a three-dimensional one, the man on horseback. Murals had the speciality of using many layers of natural pigments to give a rich and brilliant look to the figure. Ravi Varma also used to texture his canvases prior to paint on them. This texturing rendered his paintings an extraordinary richness and visual effect like in these paintings. Rama breaking the bow and the milkmaid are brilliant works in watercolour. Princess Ashwati Tirunal on Varma I saw great Indian happenings, cultural happenings, reawakenings on the young shores of America. Raja Rivi Verma, the acclaimed painter, sent across ten of his famous paintings, canvases, 
which enthralled and enticed and then captured the American mind. It had almost a um, uh, great impact, almost an impact which is almost as uh, forceful as many of the other Indian happenings. Swami Vivekananda's speech and all that has already been dealt with. I do not want to say anything more about that. But it was definitely a time for India's flowering in the foreign country. Ravi Varma was awarded with two gold medals in the Chicago World Columbian Exposition in 1893. The title of this consignment was The Life of the Native People and it consisted of pictures of women in traditional attire symbolizing the different regions of India. Some of the ten masterpieces. Swami Vivekananda, who at first praised Ravi Varma, later denounced him. We can refer this in Complete Works of Vivekananda. In early 1906, Ravi Varma was again invited by the Maharaja of Mysore to meet the visiting Prince of Wales. Even though his hands were no longer quite steady, abiding with the insistence of the Maharaja, he painted the Mysore Kedar series, a sketchy impressionistic account of trapping elephants. What made this transition? His pains? He took his precious brush again to paint Kadambari, but the brush dropped forever from his unsteady hands. A moment of unfathomable grief. Mapping his career, which signifies modernity with the nationalist attitude, he marks the transition from the court patronized artisan to a professional individual but appropriating Western neoclassical academic realism with his mythical narration. Surprising it may be, Ravi Varma's influence was mirrored in the Indian cinema also. The opulent beauties of Indian cinema and calendars can lay a claim to their descent from Varma's heroines. His famed lithographic press attracted the attention of Dada Saheb Falki, whose first assignment involving Ravi Varma was to execute photolitho transfer for the press. This acquaintance eventually led Falki, who was highly impressed and influenced by Ravi Varma paintings, to make a film which is totally Indian. In this film, Raja Harish Chandra, Falke used costumes, ornaments, lighting, and even spacing of characters in accordance with the Ravi Varma painting of the same title. It was only a beginning of Ravi Varma's influence in various fields. Soon, the best-loved visuals in India, the Ravi Varma images, were used to maximum commercial advantage worldwide. This included using the images in advertisements for merchandise ranging from infant food to tobacco. A change in coiffure of Mohini Atom was introduced during the 1960s, which was said to be inspired by Ravi Varma's paintings of Kerala women. Redesigning of costumes of Parashurama in Katakali also is the influence of Varma paintings. As a contrast, Ranjit Deshai's Marathi novel, translated into many Indian languages, brought greatest defamation to Ravi Varma. Sita, Damayanti and Sairandri, all given form here, in this studio of Kilimanur Palace. Now, 
in perfect silence. Somewhere here, Ravivama merged into eternity. Where? Nobody knows. Dilapidated studio in Baroda laments. Where is Sayojiro? Ravivama Press, a national asset, ruined by some vested interest. All these memorials we keep for the Asian Rembrandt? <laughs> Ravi Varma's aristocratic lineage, his modern outlook, his acquaintance with Travancore court, especially with Maharaja Ayalyam Thirunal, the book by Edward Moore, The Hindu Pantheon, which he got as a gift from Ayalyam Thirunal, his good relationship with the top brass of the colonial government in India, and his connections with the Parsi community of Mumbai, all these helped him enter into history. As a painter, Ravi Varma would have been a master poet. He could compose verses superbly in both Malayalam and Sanskrit. His Raga Malika and Manasayatra are clear evidences. Let us hear the lines rendered in praise of Sri Kirata Parvati, asking her to tell him whether he is correct in depicting her in his painting. <laughs> On the afternoon of 2nd October 1906, to the chant of Vedic incantations, lying on a sacred kusha grass mat, Ravi Varma passed away peacefully. Homages to the great man poured in from all over the globe. The press, national and even Reuters, carried the news with great grief. The end of an era. Really? He was a prince amongst painters, and a painter amongst princes, no? Hot to doubt. The first Indian painter to become well known. You know, before him, painters were largely anonymous. When he died, Tamil poet Subramanya Bharati wrote a poem. Hmm, a beautiful poem. Oh, uh -huh. 